hey, is everything all right in here? The talk is working? <clears throat> yeah, I think so. So I think we're good to start then. Yeah, yeah, sure. All right. Uh, so hi, everyone. Uh, welcome. Um, my name is, for those who don't know me, my name is Gigi. Um, I've been debating for way too long. Uh, I started in high school, actually, uh, and uh, kept on debating in uh, university. Um, you'll see me uh, or see me see videos of me this summer at Madrid Euros because I'm one of the two CAs. Um, but I've done, yeah, I've done a lot more, and I'm happy to see uh, so many people interested in a weekend full of workshops and debates. So, what I wanted to talk to you uh, today about is strategy, and I think it's uh, what I dislike about the word strategy is how it can mean absolutely anything. So. It's, it's basically a cheat for me to say, oh, I'll talk about strategy and then talk about whatever I feel like. What I mean by strategy specifically is how to choose what you're going to say in a debate and how to make sure that that's what's going to win the debate, uh, as opposed to just arguing whatever uh, you come up with first, <clears throat> or maybe arguing whatever you feel most comfortable arguing. So that's what I wanna talk about. I'm gonna go through a couple of steps of what that means, uh, how I do that uh, when I speak. And um, you're welcome to, okay, so there's a couple of rules for workshops with me. The first one is you can ask questions at any point. Um, at any point, there's no question time or anything. So just ask whenever something comes up that you're not clear on. The second is I talk quite fast. So if you, if I need to slow down or if there's something you didn't quite follow, just stop me and tell me and I'll repeat or rephrase. Um, then I think the last thing is, oh, if there's something that I'm not explaining that is related to what we're talking about and you're, you have a question about it, also feel free to ask me because I may, I may not have a, have a solution uh, for your related debating question, but I may have a solution. So uh, let me know. All right, is everyone clear on everything, all of that? Okay, uh, so I'm gonna ask a couple of questions also during my workshop. So hopefully uh, you'll feel feel free to answer some of them. My first question is, what do you do first? You're debating, uh, you're in A team. It doesn't matter what side you're on. It doesn't matter what position you speak. You get a motion, what do you do? I think about like the fundamental moral dilemma, why the judges chose that specific motion, what is like the clash underneath it all. Ah, interesting. I like clashes. Okay, and how do you know that something is a clash? I suppose because it's controversial, you sort of feel like, I, I don't know, it's controversial, I suppose. No, you're you're going very far in the right direction. So I actually agree, This is, but, I, but it's not the first thing I do. So I'm gonna park it. The first, absolute first thing I do is uh, I look at my partner and I make I establish that we're both clear on the same context or meaning of the debate. Um, so not not specifics like oh what countries are relevant or but just like do we vaguely understand what this debate is about? Do we have the same understanding of what this debate is about? Because otherwise the prep is going to be useless. Beyond that, so and obviously sometimes this is unnecessary. If debates are blatantly obvious or if context is provided, but in, I think most other debates, it's not. Um, so one of my favorite examples of this is like, this house would ban slum tourism. And so I think when I think of that debate, I think of favelas in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. It could equally be about gang violence, gang crime in, uh, whatever, uh, the Netherlands in, um, because we have a huge, actually we have a huge drug problem in slums in Amsterdam. I, I just think it's obviously not about that, but it's, uh, it's a tricky mistake to make in the first, first few minutes. Cause what I would do afterwards is split up or split up and have a few minutes to think for, our, uh, yourself and then do exactly what you said, Elizabeth, which is think of clashes. And I think the first thing to know about clashes is exactly what you said is they're controversial or uh, what I more simply, you, there's going to be disagreement about them. Because if there's not going to be disagreements, 
it's not a clash. More importantly, anything that is not going to have disagreement uh, as a result is not an argument. And therefore, controversial opinion, there's no point in saying something that is not controversial or that won't be refuted. So that's step one. You think of clash. And I think there's usually multiple clashes uh, in a debate. So you, you just think, what are the clashes? What are the things that will become controversial or uh, contested in this round? You write them down. I think the next thing to do is to think beyond those clashes. Maybe there are some that have priority. I'll, I'll go into this uh, in a bit. But there's there may be clashes that have priority. There may be clashes that are easier or more difficult to win. There may be uh, clashes that are more important to win uh, than others. And that's not evident. That's not immediately clear from just writing down the clashes. Because what I usually see is that debaters argue things in order, in the same order that they come up with them. So even debaters that, are, that come up with clash are clever enough to think of, to preempt what the other team's going to say. They just say it in order of what they thought of. And that's usually not the most, it's almost it, always not the most uh, like sure to win order. It's not going to be the order that gets you the most points. So think about what's the priority of my clashes. I want to go into one alternative scenario, which is one where there's not as much as, as clearly clashes, but it's Debates, I call them characterization debates. I think like the motions are the same. Sometimes debates just wholly depend, the outcome of the debate will just solely depend on what the, uh, who wins the characterization, who wins the explanation of what to associate, what context to think of when you when you see the motion. Uh, so that's motions like the one I'm, I, I'm uh, I mentioned before, but also like uh, even like this is a, uh, a favorite for some of the organizers of this competition. This house would ban zoos. It's like classically uh, a characterization debate because obviously, if the zoo is like um, Joe Exotic, a private zoo, and all the tigers get tortured and none of them are ever fed, and the employees all have one arm because they're because they're in danger, and then obviously that's that's something you should ban. But if all zoos are like um, savannas where animals roam free and they have all the food they want. It's just like sometimes, occasionally, there's a tourist and they don't they don't disturb any of the animals. And obviously, you want all the zoos not to be banned. So those are characterization debates. The easiest way to think of them is uh, the motion is this house. This house is afraid of the animal in the other room. This house believes the animal in the other room is dangerous. If I think of an elephant, I'd be arguing that. Well, it's huge, it could trample me. Uh, it's extremely dangerous. We know this from history. If my opposition thinks of a, of a mouse, not even my team partner, right? But if the opposition is thinking of a mouse, my arguments just won't make sense to them. They'll argue something completely different. Obviously, it couldn't trample you. The size that you are, it wouldn't make sense for them to be able to trample you. And they, they haven't ever killed anyone. So this, I, I'm not sure. It, obviously, they aren't dangerous. The problem with those deadlocks is it's not whomever's first. Sometimes it's whomever's first is whomever's right. You don't want that to happen because you're not always open in government. More importantly, the outcome is completely random because as a judge, what am I meant to do? I look at those two, two sets of arguments. No one's explicitly said it's a mouse or it's an elephant. They've just assumed it was. And there's no way to break, break the deadlock. So that's, I think, a different set of debates. Whenever you can preempt a deadlock like that, explain not only why you choose elephant, but why elephant is most likely. So in the case of zoos, explain why most zoos are more are likely to be the privatized mean to animals type and not the savannah roaming free type. Maybe because obviously zoos are for profit, so they wouldn't really have a reason to treat the animals as well as uh, you, you'd want them to ideally, but they'd have uh, recent, they have, they have incentive to treat the animals just as well as they need to 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 survive. So, I don't know reasoning in in uh, in favor of one of the characterizations. That's a separate set of debates, I think, or at least a separate set of clash or argument 
that I'm not going to go into as much. So let's get back to the clashes. So we've established that the first thing you do is you think of clashes, and then there's something about prioritizing them, uh, choosing them. Well, we haven't won any of them yet. So how do you win any clash? How do you win it? Is everyone clear on the concept of clash other than Elizabeth who suggested it herself also? I'm gonna assume silence is, I hate that, but I'm gonna to have to assume that silence is, you don't have any questions so far. Well, I don't, I understand. Cool. So, perfect. So, uh, you've established clashes. You haven't, you haven't necessarily chosen any of them yet because you don't know what, how, but you've, you've established some clashes. How do you win any individual clash? I suppose it depends on the metric you give. So I suppose you have to decide which, I, I'm really not sure, but I suppose it depends which clash aligns best with the metric you give. So if it like sort of, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, think, I hope that's, someone else no, that's something that, that has more to do with what clash do you pick. I'm going to give an example because it's always easier to do it by example. Let's use the example, this house would legalize all drugs. Can we come up with some clashes just for practice? I'm going to give you one. I'm going to give one away. Oh, sorry. Lisa was going to say something. Well, it's people uh, people who will um, will not buy like drugs on um, like black market versus people who may become addicted by, you know, finding them in open space. Like Perfect. So our, our, there's like, I actually think there's two clashes here. One is are drugs going to be more or less safe? As in, no, no, you know what? I'm going to go with your way. There's, if there, if drugs are legal, you wouldn't have as many contaminated drugs, which is great. But at the same time, more people would have access to drugs and would potentially become addicted. So more addicts versus more contamination. That's one. Anything else? I suppose it's like freedom of choice versus society deciding what's good for you. So the individual versus society sort of thing. Yeah. Or even, even just, um, I think freedom of choice in and of itself, like there's many things that we're not allowed to choose, not, because, not for any reason other than it's going to harm us. Like we have to wear seatbelts, even though they're super annoying and we have to, our kids have to go to school up to a certain age minimum because otherwise, you know, parents get to fuck them up too much and etc so there's a bunch of choices that you just can't you're not allowed to make because they're too harmful so it's like freedom of choice and subtext is this too harmful a choice could the effects of this choice be too harmful for for an individual to choose yeah i agree anything else sort of so, like the forbidden fruit thing or well if something is banned you will want it more Yes, but I think that's an argument in the clash that you gave. So if it's obviously if so, this is already going into to, into the next step. But let's take your clash, right? Uh, contamination versus uh, more more addicts. Obviously, if I'm saying there's less contamination, I'm not going to admit that there's more addicts. So uh, you so the opposition is going to say yes, exactly. Drugs are more accessible, which also means that uh, more people are going to use them. And that means they're going to be addicted. I, me, contamination side, I'm going to say, no, 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 no. Less, way less people are going to use them because they're no longer forbidden food. But this is already arguing, right? It's arguing back and forth within the clash. But excellent, I mean, excellent suggestion. It's also one that people forget very often, but you're already going into detail. So I'm going to say, I'm very Dutch about this. Um, drugs are illegal here. Not all of them. And the illegal ones have a huge very violent drug trade since recently like um two years ago a lawyer was shot in broad daylight uh, he was defending someone uh, involved in like a drug crime a gang case and he was most likely shot by like a 15 year old so uh that's what it's it's occupying our minds so there's crime right is there more or less crime 
when drugs are, are legal or not. Um, anything else? The, the thing is, I'm asking you also to think of potentially what would come up in the debate? Because if it's gonna come up, it has to be in a clash. It has to have a home. Because otherwise, there's two scenarios. If there's an argument that has a place in a clash, we have to know where. If it's an argument that doesn't, it's not, probably not an argument because it's not contested. So it's not gonna win you any ground in the debate. So it's not something you're gonna have to say. I'm being very strict, but you know, I'm trying to establish a logic. Okay, I actually think this is probably the most important three. Uh, so let's move. We now have the three clashes. How do you win any of these clashes? Not just, not even pick which would you pick, but how would you go about winning inside of a clash? I suppose it's like impact analysis and like sort of framing and explaining like why A, your impact is bigger and B, why that specific impact is like more important in your world versus like the other impacts. So like the... Perfect. Did you did you sneak my notes? I'm kidding. Oh, okay. That's Thank perfect. I'm, I'm joking. I'm joking. Yeah, okay. That's perfect. I actually think there's a couple of steps here. So first, let's just establish. I know that all of you know this, but the first thing you have to do is you have to give analysis as to why you your side is not just important but also true so like i just i can't just say drugs are going to be less contaminated i have to explain why that's obvious that's not the part that I, this workshop is about so beyond that i think there's three steps that you take the first step is you say what the outcome is of the argument that you've just made. So let's say you're arguing there's less contaminated drugs. You literally just say there's less contaminated drugs. That's the the outcome that is tangible, not yet object, it's objective. It's not yet subjectively important or unimportant. It's there will be less drugs that have rat poison in them. That's step one. Then step two, I call impact, which is why do I care? Not even, why does that, how does that relate to others or, but why is it important that there would be less contaminated drugs? Can you answer that? Because people suffer from them, people can die. Yeah, they kill people, man. <laughs> they kill people, that's bad. So less contaminated drugs is, and then you go, uh, less contaminated drugs means that less people die. Those are just people that potentially try drugs for the first time. There was a huge scandal here about uh, contaminated cocaine that was found out to ha be laced with white heroin and people were snorting it and it kills you. It just, there's no no ifs, ands, or buts. It doesn't matter when you reach the hospital, it just killed people, it were tourists. Um, so contaminated drugs, they kill people. Those are people that that just, cons like they there are many things other than drugs and they die as a result of contamination. That's what we can prevent. The last thing is you say why, how that is, do to you so you just link back you're like it, it just means that banning drugs for, or sorry legalizing drugs means there's less dead people this is how inside of the clash right just inside of the clash is that clear that's the basic of how you win a clash okay a few um caveats the first one is there's sometimes there's multiple arguments like these within a singular clash there can be. More importantly, there's very often multiple outcomes and impacts to any given argument. Some people are very strict about this, but I just don't see how that works. Like, obviously, with less contaminated drugs, you also have less, uh, I don't know, less, um, like, let's, what's it, uh, stigma, because a lot of the stigma from drugs also comes from people, or like, if we're, it's not because of less contamination, less stigma, but if less stigma, also less contamination, uh, obviously there's no impact to contamination if there's no stigma, because then kids could just go to their parents and say, help, help, I, I've taken rat poison. Obviously, if it's all really secretive, then maybe not so much, um, which also means there's, you can put them together and say, there's secrecy is the issue, 
and it results into in contamination and a bunch of other things. I don't care how you do it. Just I want you to be aware of the fact that there's always clashes, even if you don't know what they are yet. There's always arguments that are paths towards winning within any one of those individual clashes. And if your argument does not fit into a clash, if you don't think your argument is going to be contested, it is not an argument. That is my most important lesson. If ever you want to say something that you don't think is going to be contested, it is not worth saying it. And I'll give you, just to put the bow on this, on this, uh, on this story, there's a very logical way to, there's a way to understand this. If you imagine you have a five minute speech and you spend four and a half minutes explaining a perfect, but at, like genuinely perfect model for your, for your debate, the UN could take over, could like take your model and use it for whatever they're doing. It's perfect. There's no, still no reason for me to vote for you as a judge because you haven't given me reasons to to think that the model is a good thing to implement. You've just given me an explanation of how you would implement it and it's been very detailed. So think of it like that. Anything that isn't contested, not to say don't, don't give models. We often give models to put borders around the parts of the debate that we think are relevant and to exclude parts that are irrelevant. Which is why in very complicated debates, I would say, look, um, let's take an example. You have those debates where it's like uh, invade or like invade or uh, pull back troops from country X or something. And you're like, oh, Jesus, that would take that would take the UN like six months, man, at least. And I have to do it now. So let's see. Let's see. I, I'd usually say something like, OK, obviously. Um, it would mean uh, air support and uh, intel. I don't think this debate is about the details of what we're, what what support means. I think the more interesting part of this debate would be arguing about whether or not we want to give it. So if the opposition really wants me to go into the into the like explanation booklet, I'll do it. But I won't if they agree with me that this debate could be more relevant. And almost no opposition will will make you do it. And if they make you do it, you've saved some time because in all the cases that you would get away with it, you don't have to explain it. It's not even get away with it, but in all of the cases where you haven't preemptively explained something into, into great detail, you've saved a lot of time. Because if I'm in opposition and someone goes into a five minute model, I'd just be like, cool, thank you, moving on. And they've wasted five minutes of their speech. That's how to see if not contested, not an argument. If not an argument, don't say it in the debate. Does that make sense? Cool. Okay, so what we've done now is we've established there's clashes, how to find them vaguely. You just think of where are we going to disagree? Uh, then within any given clash, how uh, to win. The next part I think is way more relevant. After that, I'm gonna do like an exercise with you guys so we can practice. So. I think the most difficult part is choosing, uh, or the part that people find most difficult is, is choosing which clash to, to run with, what argument to pick first, how to build my case. Does anyone have any, uh, like, does anyone want to say how they usually do that? Like, how do you usually pick your arguments or clashes or whatever? Okay, if no one's going to say anything, I suppose sure. I, choose, uh, I choose the clash that um, has the biggest impact, I suppose, and also the one that fits best to my metric. So if I'm running like, I don't know, some sort of, I don't know, philosophical like metric that we want to achieve this in the world. And if I feel that clash like helps achieve it best, then cool. that, yeah, I don't good. Know. Very good. Anyone else? Just to say about what you just said, I do that in reverse order, which is, so I pick the clash and then I pick the metric. Because obviously, if I pick a metric first and I don't have a clash that fits, I'm fucked. I just think, and here's my controversial theory number two, I don't actually think there's ever a uh, objectively best uh, order. There isn't. 
there isn't an objective uh, measurement of what is the most important class or what the best one is to run. It's all malleable. And that's what I'm going to explain to you is how to make sure that whatever you pick, even if your argument is uh, uh, not, it doesn't intuitively seem relevant or whatever, how to make it the most important thing in the round, AKA how to win with a class that you pick. So I have a list of ways. Uh, stop me at any point, yeah? So this is a list of how to make whatever clash and then argument you pick the most important one. The first one is you talk about the size of the group of people that is impacted. So uh, obviously contamination is way worse than uh, more addicts because there's a lot more people that uh, try, literally you just try drugs a singular time and get and have them contaminated than number of people that try them often enough to get addicted. So we have way more people that end up in the hospital due to contamination than due to addiction, way more lives ruined. It, therefore, contamination is more important than addiction. That's number one. Number two is the intensity of the suffering. So imagine I have a 100,000 euro budget for uh, health services in country X. I could choose to spend it on two kidney transplants or vitamin C pills for every, every person in my country for uh, a year. Theory A, so my the previous thing I mentioned, so a number of people say, oh, you, you help so many people with your vitamin C. But obviously the intensity of the suffering is way worse for the people who need a kidney transplant but don't get a tr kidney transplant because they die. Or, well, they, they go on dialysis and then they eventually die. So you say it's not, the, the intensity of the suffering that you can prevent by giving people a kidney transplant, it's so much more important. They, this is what their life is about compared to the people that could maybe get a vitamin C pill and maybe not take it or whatever. It's important to weigh the intensity of how severely they suffer more than how many people we could help. Does that make sense? In the drugs debate, this is like, look, you can get contaminated drugs uh, once, you get really sick, you pull out. An addict is an addict for the rest of their life. It's, uh, and that's actually going, It's it, it crosses two, um, two th of these strategies, because the next one I want to give is timeline, like how long is the suffering? How long does it last for? But addiction is just a very intense type of suffering. You're isolated. No one uh, wants to help you with anything. You're usually out of a job. I don't know. I'm, I'm really stereotyping addiction here, but like severely, really severe addiction just is stigmatized to the point where people have nothing anymore. That's the, that's such an intense type of suffering that we should weigh way more heavily than, than people who get contaminated drugs once and maybe get quite sick, but then pull out. Yeah. So I gave this one away. Number three is how long does the suffering last for? So, uh, in this case, uh, you could apply it to the contamination thing, but also also the drug violence thing because it's like look you legalize drugs once you set up these networks. They last forever um, We saw this something really funny happened uh, When COVID when first the Netherlands closed like um, uh, Services industry and stuff here due to COVID's restrictions the first thing that happened was uh, people no they also announced that they were gonna close coffee shops, which is where you buy weed here, legal weed. The first thing that happened was lines, lines and lines and lines. Every coffee shop had lines going around the block of people waiting to buy their weed. Fair enough. The next thing that happened was drug gangs showed up and were handing out like phone numbers. Call me if you run out. That's something that happens because uh, if drugs are illegal, you, I don't know, make this, let's make this argument. Drugs are illegal, you get gangs, blah, blah, blah. That's way worse than uh, any other impact because those drugs, those gangs, you don't get rid of. That's a network, that's a, 
an infrastructure that remains beyond whatever the uh, their origin is. So it lasts for way longer. So we should weigh it for way way. We should weigh it heavier. Other big thing. Very often, uh, climate debates. We forget to say this. Uh, the cl climate change isn't just relevant or like an important impact because it's really bad and like because of how severe it is, but also because it, it lasts forever. So we can't reverse it. It's what whatever mistake, whatever you pile on to the climate doesn't ever disappear. So it's also an intensity or like a, it's both the intensity and the timeline. Our grandchildren, if there's an earth, will have the climate that we gave them and whatever they accumulated onto it. So timeline. Then number four is vulnerability. Uh, debaters are uh, mixed on this, but I just think it's important uh, because because I believe it's important, not because... So you'll very often hear in debates, especially from certain circuits, uh, they're... Uh, they're more vulnerable. We have a minority argument. Uh, this debate is about minorities, whatever. And you're like, you know what? Minorities are also minorities. There, there's fewer of them. The reason we weigh minority arguments, that's the worst possible way to call it, but vulnerability arguments heavy is because uh, some, some people are feel more deserving of of resource, of help, of help, of attention than other people. Some people are less resilient to harm than other people. Some people have already been harmed. So in the debate uh, about drugs, this is about drug drug violence, for example, drug gangs. Like people, the, the harm or the impact of drug gangs isn't just that they deal in drugs and are violent, but also that the 15-year-old kid killed someone. That 15-year-old kid wasn't, doing well in school and have had like a hugely amazing life otherwise. Obviously that kid was vulnerable to the extent that it was uh, easy to recruit him or her into a gang. So we should care a lot about that because those people already have been duped. They have no support network. Uh, they're more deserving therefore of help, even if it's if it seems less intense or uh, less uh, less of a long-term thing. Yeah? Cool. Uh, <coughs> yeah, go for it. I'm sorry. So, so basically, you can uh, calculate impact, impact by multiplying, um, so to say, the amount of people that, um, that are, um, so to say, um, um, affected by, by the problem, yep. the, the period and um and the intensity right yes yes so, that's the that's the perfectly utilitarian way of doing it yes okay so um is there any like order which, which stuff is more important or less important or do you calculate this by by i don't know by value so somehow so i don't very good question uh, I usually don't. The reason is it's often quite obvious which one applies. There's a, op there's usually only one that applies to a clash. So like the clash, uh, a singular clash, you will have, let's assume you, are, you made an argument at one a certain clash. There's usually one very obvious weighing, very obvious, let's call this uh, like um, importance, uh, try it, like this is basically how to establish important right importance right to any clash so let's say uh, you've made an argument you want to clash there's usually one very obvious way that is most intuitive and most fitting out of this list to pick for that clash you'll and I would usually only pick one because it gets the water gets muddy otherwise as that is, to say, do that for one clash. If you have multiple clashes, you will, because you make multiple arguments, I hope. So you make multiple arguments, you win multiple clashes. You'll have multiple explanations of why this clash could potentially be the most important clash in the debate. Those are independent of each other, but I would I would stick to not, I, your calculation is very interesting. Uh, I like it, I hadn't thought of it that way yet before. 
the uh, I wouldn't directly apply it to debates because it would assume that I think it would end up meaning that only the biggest group wins ever, first of all, because it's the biggest factor. It has the biggest variance. But most importantly, I'm, I'm just not sure that it, all of those three factors apply to every clash. There's not always a way to explain that you have most people, they're most vulnerable, uh, the intensity is worst, and the suffering lasts the longest. Right? Does that sort of answer your question? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Cool. So I have one additional um, uh, st strategy, one additional uh, way to establish importance, and it applies almost solely to debates where you're dealing in principles. Because uh, those get really fucked, right? You're like, uh, okay, this uh, this house would ban religious schools. Big deal here right now. Big deal in Europe right now. It's like, uh, okay, we ha there's a fr right to freedom of religion. Yeah, there's also a right to freedom of ident like freedom of speech. So if if the religious school bans certain freedoms of speech, or if the religious school bans is is Christian but bans uh, Muslim kids. I'm not sure if it's which how to weigh right or for example, um, let's say, uh, oh th this is a um, fun fact about the Netherlands. Sorry, I'm talking so much about the Netherlands, but it's where I live and it's it's a it's a hugely very an interesting country. So I'm trying to give you the most interesting factoids. Uh, fun fact about the Netherlands, it's illegal to insult the king here, to insult the monarchy. It's actually illegal. And it's been like, there's been arrests. W one, uh, because this guy went to Amsterdam, sat in the dead center of Amsterdam, started screaming, fuck the king, fuck the king, fuck the king, fuck the king, until someone arrested him. It was really funny. So that's like, I don't know. Um, there's a right to uh, freedom of speech, but there's also a right to, there's something about identity and nationality, right? That's why that law exists, supposedly. Uh, more relevant is in most countries you can't, hate speech is illegal. So there's a right to identity, but there's also a right to autonomy. You get protected from certain speech, right? There's these conflicts. I suggest that a way to solve those conflicts is to explain fundamentality. So to explain which one is necessary for the other to exist. So let's take the um, uh, religious schools thing, right? So the argument in favor of religious schools is like argument, uh, I have a right to freedom of, uh, freedom of religion because it's hugely important to my identity and uh, Taking that from someone is like taking their meaningful, uh, is, is taking how they meaningfully exist. I would say, well, sure, but you can't act meaningfully have a right to religion if you don't have a right to freedom of speech. Because you can be free in your religion, but if it means that you can't walk outside, uh, announce your religion and not get beaten up for it, then you don't. Obviously, you wouldn't have a meaningful right to freedom of religion if someone could still beat you up for it, right? It would still, you would most likely not express your freedom of religion. So there's, in this conflict, you need to choose freedom of uh, speech because without freedom of speech, you can't have freedom of religion. Yeah? Other way around, equally, uh, sure, you can have a right to freedom of speech, but if you have a right to say whatever you want ex except about your religion, then there's a huge group of people that aren't meaningfully free to express themselves because meaningfully they can't express something that is hugely important to them, which is their religion. So you can't actually have freedom of speech without freedom of religion. Either way, this works both ways. So how, you, you may wonder, you may be wondering, wait, but if this works both ways, how is that useful for me? Because they will just flip it on me. No one knows. No one ever does this. Uh, and that's, I think, true for a lot of this workshop. I think a lot of it is quite obvious. And it's structuring thoughts that you may have had many times before. It's just, as a judge, I've judged a lot. And as a judge, you're very often lost, not in who explained this argument to a point where I can believe it's truth. Uh, you get stuck in who explained the argument that I'm going to give the win. Uh, because they're all vaguely, equally well explained, 
that's when your judges are going to throw around things like it was a wash. Things can't be a wash. Like just mathematically, they can't be a wash because there's seven minutes or there's 14 minutes on two teams. You can't reasonably explain something to exactly the same extent, but it's when judges just get lost. They're like, I don't know. Uh, these arguments were both kind of relevant, but I don't really get it. I don't really know how to weigh them. You're giving your judge uh, methods to weigh. Uh, that applies to all five of the, the methods that I just gave you. It's, it's telling your judge, you can pick my clash because this aff affects more people. It affects the more important people. And you'll notice that once you start doing this, your judges, you will hear it also in, uh, in your oral adjudication after debates. Judges will start taking over what you've been saying. They'll be like, oh, yeah. Um, so uh, you explain blah, blah, blah. Uh, comparing to other team, blah. Um, we eventually decided that, you know what, the number of people that were affected by the argument that you made were so much, uh, so, like the group of people that you affect is so much larger that probably your impact applies to blah, blah, blah. That's why uh, we think the argument weighs more heavily. And you're like, I said that it will happen. Uh, and it's, I think an under, it's just m most importantly, it's an undervalued part of debating, not, not as much something that is, I think, revolutionary. So, so far, does that make sense? Question so far. Yeah, Elizabeth. Sorry, I just have a question about like sort of how to make a clash like important. You were sort of, from what I understood, it was like focusing on the utilitarian sort of basis of it. But what if you give like a completely different metric that is like, say, for example, the principle based one saying, you know, freedom is important and we're willing to suffer even because of it. So like, is there a way to like sort of make to show that a clash is important, even if it doesn't have like utilitarian like benefit in a way that it's just like this philosophical principle that we're willing to suffer for? That so, uh, so your scenario is there's not two principles, but there's a principle and a utilitarian claim. Yes. Utilitarianism is also a principle, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's like a non utilitarian, non consequential argument that you want to make. And you want to explain why it wins over? Yes. Okay. I have very strong opinions about this. The first thing is, it's absolutely idiotic that judges just assume that consequences are always the sort of, that's the starting point, right? You have a burden, in the, as a debater, you have a burden to explain a non-consequential argument to be relevant. And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> Theoretically, there is no, I really don't think we should be making the assumption that consequential arguments are in and of themselves more valid. But fine, let's deal with reality. Your judges do. So I, that's something different. I think that's almost more refutation, but I'll, I'll tell you a few strategies that I'd have for it. The first thing is just to point out that you're making a non consequentialist argument that is theoretically equally valid to a utilitarian argument. You explain your argument, then you give it impact. Uh, I, I'd make it as specific as possible. So freedom usually doesn't work. But for example, I've made uh, arguments about um, uh, self-defense. I love self-defense. It's such a stupid, stupid law. I've made self-defense arguments very often because they're like, so, okay. What self-defense basically means is if, if someone attacks you and you do nothing, you may die. And they don't, and they run away. Self-defense gives you, gives you the right to harm them, even if that means that both of you die. And it's almost universally applied. There's almost no countries that don't have this. Everyone finds this a really intuitive, uh, intuitive like right, or non-consequentialist right. So there's a lot of other things that you can explain are analogous to uh, right to self-defense. So like, I don't know, uh, Palestinian secession. Uh, is a right to self-defense because if not they're like basically any any identity that is being lost in this case I randomly chose uh, this one uh, it's a right it's basically analogous to right to self-defense because they're being attacked there's no alternative or at least those have been depleted if not if they wouldn't do anything most likely Palestinian uh, Nash like the Palestinian people will be uh worse off a lot worse off in uh in 10 years maybe um non-existent in x number of years 
So they have the right to defend themselves, even if it harms them and everyone else. Uh, which means that they can, I don't know, do fucked up shit, even if it means that Israel will bomb them back or whatever. Does that make sense? I know that it's like, that's the, it's a stupid uh, example, but like I've made the argument, I've actually made the arguments where in the, I think my funniest one was I did it in, a, in, a, in an animals, a debate about animals. It was like um, that, God, that was, the motion was stupid. It was like that uh, something, okay, so exotic game, exotic animals, people that hunt exotic game, you should be free to kill them. That was the debate. I was like, well, no. That sounds stupid. But obviously I was gov, so I was like, yay. So we made the argument that exotic game, exotic animals don't have means to defend themselves. Um, and attacking their attacker is, uh, is taking up their defense. They have no means. They're going to be harmed. They have no way out, and it's it's life threatening, and it's set up, which means that they have a right to self defense, and we're and 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 attacking their attacker should be a right because it uh, it sort of assumes their inability to defend themselves, and we won. So, I mean, don't um, I, I won't tell you if the judge was right, but does that sort of make sense? Like, there's arguments where you can run a principle and make it non consequential. The first step is you say, you're assuming consequentialism, that's wrong. And the judge will be like, Oh, no, but there's more steps. So step two is you say, a right, let's say to you, uh, I don't think there's many non consequentialist rights, to be fair, because often, right to freedom of religion is just because people are happier when they can be religious. But uh, you, let's say, a right to secede. Secession is usually worse for everyone. Right to freedom of identity, and therefore secession is usually worse for everyone. Way to defend it is to say like, the right of a group of people doesn't have, you have a certain right, even if you if the way you execute it is non-consequential, so, or is against your own interests. For example, the right to vote. Most people vote for something that isn't in their own interest. And we don't care, it's their right. As a human, it is your right to be a certain person, to vote in a stupid way, and, uh, to, and to be a certain person, you have to have certain rights, which include the right to freedom of identity. And then you explain secession, even if, and then you say, look, even if everyone is worse off, they have a right to secede. Does that sort of answer your question? Okay, any other questions so far? Okay, so then if not, there's a couple more things I want to explain and then I'm going to, we're going to take a break and then do an exercise. So uh, this is, a, that, that was a list of meta debating, number one, making yourself more important than the other, right? There's, there's more. So uh, the second thing in this is I want to talk briefly about uh, extending. So I think my theory of uh, conten contention and stuff applies quite nicely to ex to extension. So what I see very often is either one of two things. Either uh, team in closing sees argument is touched by opening and is like, okay, that's theirs then. I'll just leave it because they've licked it and now I don't want to touch it. Uh, alternatively, I'll see teams in closing very, very, very convinced of their their viable extension, analysis extension, they'll say. They say, they'll be thinking, ah, oh, I, I know that they've explained a lot of this argument, but there's a very important addition that I want to make that will still be viable as an extension. It's true, that's true. Uh, but as long as you don't explain why your extension was pivotal, why it doesn't break the, a deadlock or further a point of contention in your favor, it has done nothing. So very, very uh, concretely, if you run an analysis, if you decide to run an analysis extension, be sure that your analysis either underlies the logic of your opening half. So to say, without my logic, opening half doesn't make any sense, or your analysis improves the argument to the point where it beats the other side 
more than they already have. If none of those two, you can't run it because it's going to be interesting or very often an alternative way to explain the argument that's already been explained, but not a better way to explain the argument that's already been explained. And therefore you will get zero credits. And that's, to, that's because the clash has already been won. So your judge will somehow pigeon brained even then still realize that sure they've made an argument and it was different than their opening but the, their opening made an, the the argument that already won that clash so make an argument to extend your opening based on analysis only if you know that you're winning a clash more than your opening already has then lastly there's also a strategy a strategy to making others unimportant as opposed to just yourself important uh importantly first of all do that to your opening that's increasingly allowed to just very to explicitly say why your opening is less important than you not why they're, what they said is not true or not important but you can say why you're more important or why there were still holes so you can say stuff like uh opening very nicely explained the history of the conflict in Iraq. So we're gonna talk about why this motion improves the outcome, which is so, which is so patronizing. It's like, well, fuck no, we didn't explain. As an opening, you'd be thinking, fuck no, we didn't just explain history, we made an argument. And your closing is just like, hmm, I don't think you did. Uh, more relevant to this workshop, you can say stuff like, uh, so, um, opening talks about uh, contaminated drugs. We're going to talk about drug gangs. Um, not, I mean, there's obviously problems with contamination, but the scale of uh, the number of people affected by drug gangs is so large that it has to be the most important consideration in this round. So you don't just do that to your to opposing teams. You also do that to your opening. You can't. So very important. You you cannot disagree with them but you can be passive aggressive, uh, nicely uh, diminishing, I guess is the best way to say it. Okay, then uh, lastly, you, uh, you can use both your choice of clash and POIs to, dis to make others unimportant. So um, first POIs, if I'm closing, I would always, and, and I'm afraid of my opening, because I'm, I'm unsure if we really extended, blah, blah. You use your POI to bash them. Even if it's, I mean, they're not in the, they're, they're not in the interaction, right? I'm POIing someone on opposition, I'm closing government and I'm afraid of opening government. I use my POI to fuck opening government because I'm scared of them, right? If, if I think they're winning, you wanna take them down. So a POI would be something like, uh, so we explain blah, 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 blah. And opening government gave the example do you want to respond? Again, you diminish the contribution of your opening without explicitly disagreeing with them. We gave an argument of which they already gave the example. An example doesn't win them anything. The argument wins you something. So you're diminishing their contribution, even if they're not in the interaction, doesn't matter. And you always do that. I think you, that's the sort of the, the way to, to use POIs, to think of POIs. It's uh, go after who you think is winning Always, because if you beat the winner, you're first. And uh, it doesn't matter if the person you think is winning is the one you're POIing. You can POI whomever about whomever. Uh, equally, you can POI a closing about their opening because they can't disagree with them. And they very often think they have to defend them stupidly. So if, you're, if you go like, so your opening made this and this argument. Um, how does that work if blah, rebuttal? How does that work if uh, this and this is also true? And they intuitively they start defending it because it's an argument for their side, even if it was a ridiculous argument. And it's a waste of time for them. And it's a waste of time for, and, and that's good for me, right? The more time wasted, the better uh, I'm doing. And this, and this uh, uh, apart from POIs, this also applies to how you pick your clashes. This is a bit sneaky, but there's, I think, I mean, sometimes you'll just know the teams in the room before you go in and you know what team to be. Most likely, you know, most likely who the good team is going to be. You know, you're on circuit. You're like, oh, fuck, they got, they won a Russian championship last year. Oh, shit. 
and we lost to them in the final. They're probably the best team in this room. They, they might not be, but they're most likely to be. In that case, you want to direct uh, your clash towards them, or at least the explanation of why you're important, you want to direct at them. So that means that if they're your opening, you want to say uh, argument uh, proves clash, clash is important because, and then you give reasons that compare you to your opening mostly. If they're an opposing team, you compare your the arguments you made to theirs. You can think of this beforehand. If you can't, uh, you can always think of it if you're closing, because in closing you have a bunch of time. So uh, my advice would be for closing teams, as opposed to opening teams, right, where you have to pick from the get-go what clashes are we going to run, and you have to there has to be some time for analysis, writing down, blah blah blah. You don't have to do that in closing. You can just you can just think what are all the different clashes that can happen in this debate. Not how can I win any of these clashes? Not yet. But more, how can we make any of these clashes win? And then you can just cross them off while the debate is going. Oh crap, that one was already done. Let's do that. And then start writing analysis because obviously there's going to be a lot of dead time in the debate. For example, when uh, an opponent is talking, it's going to be either you or your partner that's going to respond to them, not both of you. Presumably you only have to rebut an argument once. So you decide, okay, you listen to this argument, you take this and I'll take, I'll start, I'll keep writing my extension. Does that make sense? I started doing this and got a lot worse and then a lot better. So uh, I know it's a, this may be a big adjustment, thinking of closing as purely, um, as not preemptive, but purely reactive, but I think it works. Because you have a lot more knowledge than you had in prep, right? You know how the how the opening teams and maybe also CG how they did, so you already know. I mean, you probably vaguely know what a call. You know who you're afraid of, uh, and that gives you a lot of uh, information to base your extension on. Clear so far. Okay, in that case, I was gonna suggest we take like a ten minute break and then we come back and we do exercises. Is that good? Okay, perfect. Then I'll see you, uh, yeah, in 10 minutes. Let's uh, continue, if everyone's okay with that. It's totally fine if you're not sure. The, the whole point of this, making you do this, uh, was to see if you can uh, use what I was explaining. If not, that's equally important. Um, and we'll just go through it. So does anyone want to... Uh, start. Give uh, an example of something they explained, or something they came up with, or if even before that, if there's any questions or any suggestions. Um, yeah. Um, well, um, the clash that um, um, that could could. Uh, could work in this game probably is that um, um, there is a um, like a division of society on one hand versus uh, um, the more effective uh, the opportunity to um, defend uh, the interests of uh, of women uh, more effectively. So yeah, like perfect, perfect. So. I'm going to narrow in on this. So you say there is on one side, it's more effective. I actually think, you know what? I actually think you have two clashes there. Uh, uh, but correct me if I'm wrong. So I would mm -hmm. say uh, the effectiveness clash is an, it's a separate clash because you could say that having feminist parties makes for more effective feminist policies. This is assuming the feminist policies are good, right? Mm -hmm. But debating is very, very liberal. So you can, I think, uh, you can argue against it, and uh, but also assume that it is. Um, so right. one side is uh, you can say uh, I don't know uh, feminist parties make for more effective policy because they argue for it, uh, making it more likely to be put on the agenda, like for there to be feminist policies. The other side is like oh, but maybe other parties would stop being feminist if there is like a feminist party because they can't get any voters with feminist policies, yeah. right? So you can say effectiveness, mm -hmm. is there 
effective feminist policies one. And then the other one, also very good clash, is uh, divisiveness. And does this make feminist feminism more or less divisive? Because on the one hand, you can say, well, if there's a feminist party, then it's not, it becomes less controversial to say uh, in public, oh, I'm a feminist, maybe. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, it makes it more controversial because it, it makes it political uh, in the same way that uh, some progressive policies become very, very controversial when uh, progressive beliefs become very controversial when they become political. Is that fair to say? I think you just got two clashes. Yeah, yeah right. Cool. So any other clashes? Yeah, I think like that's maybe a... there is a clash. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay, thanks. Um, there is a clash between you know, like women getting a voice in politics and uh, these kind of people in the party representing being kind of the spokesman for the whole community. So it might actually like promote some ideas, and depending on what these people say, and politicians do say some controversial things. Inevitably, this will kind of harm way more people. Perfect. So it's it, it's to do with like what does what changes about feminism uh, as a movement more than it just being political. Uh, if there is certain because feminism, I mean, I'm a feminist, but I never got my invitation. I never have. I, I don't have a membership card or anything. Uh, so I, anyone can be a feminist and say that they're a feminist. And there's some feminists that I I deeply disagree with, uh, who I think have fucked up beliefs. But I don't have to. There's, it doesn't matter right now because there's no feminist political party. But once there are spokespeople, they decide sort of what feminism becomes. So that changes maybe how many people are feminist. Very, very good. Any other clashes? Yeah, I think uh, that's uh, this topic is not only about feminism and problems of feminism. It's uh, like a bit wider. Uh, much wider. It's uh, like uh, good to compare number of people like from the whole society because we will have such a party in uh, parliament so they will represent some group and they will somehow affect like laws. Uh, they create certain laws and so on. They will vote for some uh, laws and uh, with uh, like interests of uh, feminists or women at all. Uh, so uh, I think it can be argument from the opposite, uh, from the opposition, that there is no need to have such parties in parliament if it still exists, uh, like this um, political parties at all. Many women can vote for this party because of existing problems with like women and men equality like uh, that shows movements like me too uh harassment uh, scandals and so on and uh there is a trend to create political parties which uh concentrate on one certain issue like pirate party like yeah. greens and so on but legislative like lawmakers they create abstract norms which affects whole society and they like uh they reach beyond what they promise. Like they, they go far beyond what the sort of uh, what the platform for a feminist party would would yeah, potentially yeah. be. Yeah, there are just and they tend to be incompetent in such questions. I mean, in larger questions, uh, there are too many questions where we cannot like uh, use this logic. We can we cannot protect like uh, women or like at all human rights and uh it's important to show that there are like parties uh that like democrats in usa like liberal parties in europe that uh can protect uh like uh they're women's both right yeah yeah no, they're both not, feminists we, we but also a need... bunch of other things yes yes exactly and... so this is perfect okay first thing to say is i think you do touch on a bunch of different clashes but i think the the very the hugely essential one that I think is very 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 fundamental to this debate is what happens to political parties because so it, we have the Netherlands has a green party a labor party a animal party a socialist party that are basically they're more they lean they lean communist we have uh, a centrist progressive par two th three centrist progressive parties there are currently seventeen parties in parliament and uh, lots of them, bunch of them, no, far too few of them, but a couple of them are very explicitly feminist. Um, but 
what you're asking from people to do when you're a feminist party is you say, we're a feminist social, like single issue party. What you have to do is vote for us. And this is the one priority that you have. And I think there's very few people that only have one priority in mind when they vote. I'm a feminist, but I'm also very concerned with environmental degradation. I'm also very concerned with inequality on a more broader, on a more broad scale. I'm, I'm concerned with healthcare. So yeah, I would like, I would like for parties to be more feminist, but I don't, th but I wouldn't say that my political ideology would be summarized by being feminist. So on the one hand you say, oh, there's very explicit feminist representation. On the other hand, you say it diminishes feminist re representation in liberal parties who no longer have to be feminist because their voters, the voters that were really, really feminist, well, they can go to the feminist party, but it's no, it's not a competition they can win either, right? A green party can't be, can't out feminist the feminist party. So they drop it and the feminist party is the feminist party. And that makes it maybe way more controversial exactly the way you say, and that makes it less likely that it becomes a sort of a broader principle as opposed to a, a highly contentious point of discussion in politics. Perfect. Is there anything that you think is missing from any of these clashes so far? I had like a small point, I suppose, about like sort of political capital of the feminist like sort of movement. It's not um, simply like sort of politics. It's more, I suppose, like societal capital and the fact that the feminist movement is based on supporting women, supporting one another. And I feel that if the feminist party focused all their resources on politics, which it ha which they'd have to do if they f like formed one party, because it's an awful lot of money in most countries with lobbying, etc. Um, so they would they would like sort of inevitably spend less money on social outreach programs, which would make them seem like out of touch with like normal women. And I think that like, yeah. social, like social capital is a lot more important for feminists than political capital. And like I also sort of agree with the frame that look even if feminists formed a party they wouldn't even get political capital i don't know how it works in the netherlands but in england we have like a winner take all system so in a region if like yeah. the majority of people voted i know i lived in oxford for a couple for like a half a year and i thought that was like the stupidest fucking shit <laughs> yeah. ever we have we have uh proportional representation so like uh, oh, party okay. so it's yeah different. So, but, like, yeah very like, different but yeah, yeah. so yeah so, they would never win in the uk yeah, exactly never. like for example ukip got like 12 percent of the vote i think but they only had like one mp in parliament so out like, of the, the feminist, hundreds yeah. yeah 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 so like um the feminist party wouldn't actually have any chance to change any, anything whereas if they yeah. were in a major party that was already established they would be able to change something but yeah, also perfect. like with less money as well and then be able to i spend. think again two clashes one is uh how much can they change and i think that's to do with what we discussed before the last thing you said on like regardless of political system they're not going to get they're not going to get a majority i don't think anyone in the debate is going to try to argue that they get a majority so given that they, they get quite a small uh stake how much are they viably going to do the other thing i think you said is very new which is who does what is likely to be the type of policy or the type of action that a feminist party pushes for as opposed to a feminist movement or feminist people in broader society. And to be fair, I, I don't know what it's like uh, in every country, but I, I'm, I'm willing to say that it's very likely that people who get into politics, feminists or not, are more likely to be white, are more likely to be wealthy, are more likely to know wealthy people and have a, have a university education. So I think the type of people that you uh, even and, and the same even goes for voting, right? Voting is skewed, like uh, whether or not people go and vote is skewed towards level of education and wealth. So even then, right, you, it's more likely to just be a white feminist party and not to do, I don't know, uh, free menstrual products because they're like, I've never had that issue. And they may push for things like, uh, easier access to CEO positions for women, which is great, but also I don't think the most pressing issue for most uh, feminist movements. So exactly, they become skewed to a certain type of feminism also. So I'm gonna summarize, I think what I think the clashes were so far. So there's, first of all, there's like, are there more or less voters for feminism uh, if there would be a political party with on one side, well, there would be voters explicitly uh, that vote for feminism that uh, 
that strong, strongly signal that feminism is an important issue to them. On the other side, uh, it's not likely to be that many because there's lots of people that are feminist, but also have a bunch of other ideals. Then secondly, there's, uh, are there more or less feminists in parliament, which is partly a result of the first, but also I think partially different because the number, I mean, there's quite a few people who know who's the 54th MP for uh, for the Tories or any given Labour Party. And they just get voted in because they got seats. Uh, and they could quite easily, for a Labour Party, be very, very feminist. Um, so there's secret, <laughs> not secret, but there's like, there's lots of feminists in Parliament uh, that get through not because of their feminism, but because of a bunch of other things. And then those people would have to be, would be more, would be less likely to be feminist if they had to compete with a feminist party that they couldn't, as we said before, out feminist. Then there's, uh, would there be more or less feminist policies passed and what kind would those policies be? The last thing we just discussed. Um, and I think lastly, would there be more or less feminist ideology in society uh, at large? Does that sort of summarize? Does anyone feel like I'm missing anything from what we discussed before? I think that's largely what we said, right? Now, pick one. Has anyone uh, thought of ways to pick one and explain why it wins? I'm going to give you one. Uh, feminist ideology in society is the most important clash in this round because the number of people that very attentively and actively listen to politics and even the number of people that are aware of the effects of politics when they do, when they when it comes to feminism is a very small group compared to everyone in society and how it affects them if more people become more friendly towards feminism so like i'm sure it's helpful this if there's more women ceos it's even more helpful if next time I'm walking home and it's dark out, someone doesn't yell random shit at me because I'm a woman. And the second is a result of societal campaign. The first is a result of policy and it's a trade off because of resources. So the clash feminism in society is most important because it affects way more people than anything else. Anyone else want to try one? I know this is the trickier part. Uh, I'm going to give you another one. This one I think is the trickiest one, maybe. It's more feminists in parliament, regardless of policy or voters, right? I think you can say that just by virtue of having feminists in policy, you have the biggest effect the most intense effect because that's the only way to inspire women to want to become women and other feminists to be fair to become politicians uh when they see someone in a power in a position of power in a position that they respect who is a representative of people argue for feminist policy so it's the most important clash in this round because it affects the longest timeline it's most uh, is sort of the most uh, sustainable uh, because it inspires young uh, young feminists to strive for positions of power, and that outlasts anything else. Does that make sense? I suppose, like maybe another one would be like sort of the apoliticization of like feminism. So just explaining why it's so important that feminists, like you said, are spread out between parties and how if we had a feminist party, they would have to, they would be forced to take a line on certain issues, which fem which people who previously called themselves feminists might not agree with, and therefore it's likely to alienate people. So the fact that actually having a feminist party doesn't increase the like support, the political capital they have, rather having feminists spread out throughout different political parties and throughout society as a whole increases their political capital because it's, people are more likely to find this feminist that they agree with and share views with. Perfect. Why is it the most important in the debate? 
because um, the whole point of feminism is to have people support women's rights and it's impossible to always constantly police that. We need people to fundamentally understand that and support that and therefore the more people, yeah? Yeah, I'm thinking, I agree, but I could say, so I think the way to test if you're saying, if you're giving an explanation of importance is, can you say the exact opposite and it, it will be just as, uh, just as effective? And look, this is, I'm, I, I'm overdoing it. That's not, I think, not perfectly applicable to what you just said, but the point of feminism, I think, is, content, is uh, contentious. And uh, I think there's a way, a very easy way to explain that what you just said is the most important thing in the debate. And it's, I think, I would grab for, uh, it's the, look, the women that join political movements and blah, 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 uh, they are also very white and wealthy and blah, 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 uh, because they have time on their hands and they've read uh, Sylvia Plath and shit and Gloria Steinem and now they're like woke feminists. What feminist uh, politicians do across parties is build a coalition, build support for policies that can help women who are way more vulnerable than that, who feminism can never, ever, ever reach. So it's a vulnerability argument, I think, because you're saying, because the, the end effect, it's not, I think, unfortunately, it's not what feminism has always been about. Uh, the suffragettes were uh, supported by a lot of black women who didn't get the right to vote. Uh, but it's what feminism can be about to help the women who need the help the most. Uh, and you can only do that by having not a few feminists in, par in parliament uh, who are the feminist party, who are this is best case scenario who are shouting feminism, but having feminists exactly, as you said, across parties who can, uh, who can coalesce and uh, come to feminist policy. Does that sort of make sense? Yeah, definitely, thank you. Okay. Uh, I think you get the point. I'm gonna say, I think we get the point. I'm, first of all, compliments for the clashes because you got way further than I've ever, gotten with this workshop i usually get uh feminism is good and i'm like yes but that's everyone in the debate is going to say that uh and and you did you you got to absolutely everything in the round uh and you also i think get really far in explaining the importance of clashes does everyone sort of does it does anyone have any questions on why would you do this is that because i understand that it to some people this may seem like a waste of time um because you could just as easily just argue in favor of against you could just ex be explaining and at, at, like analyzing why more women, why more policy. But I guess the point is in the in debates like these, uh, you get stuck when everyone agrees that feminism is good. Proposition in favor of, of feminist political parties will just be saying there's an explicit voice for feminism. It's really important to have that. Uh, you get way more airtime for feminism, blah, blah, blah. And then Op says, yeah, but way less people are going to associate with feminism if it's just that specific type of thing. And there's that's one. And then the other thing is opposition is going to say uh, feminist uh, political party is way less effective than uh, social movement. And prop says, no, it isn't because blah, blah, blah. And then you're stuck because which one is more important? Like, do I care about the social movement? Do I care about the airtime? Do I care about the number of feminists in society? Do I care about the number of women in parliament? Do I care about... And uh, I don't think you're ever going to prove exclusively or definitively why one of these is most important, but you're definitely going to be able to push the importance of one over the other. Uh, and you want to do that because it will work in your favor. Does that sort of... Cool. Okay, so we talked about a bunch of things about how to come up with clashes, how to win the clash, mo and then most importantly, how to make the clash most important and how to weaponize that against opponents, against your opening, against your closing, and POIs, in break time, in uh, whatever. And we did an exercise. Does anyone have any questions about any of this? Or questions that I could potentially answer about anything else? <laughs> uh, yep, I have a question. Yeah. Um, like, uh, moving to our example with these uh, three clashes of feminism, um, I think when it uh, would be, uh, if I am on the closing half and uh, 
uh, I need to beat uh, my opening half. So they probably will choose the third clash about feminist uh, ideology in the society, which affects more people, and we can choose um, this about intense effect uh, about more or less feminists. Feminists uh, have to compete uh, within parties. Yeah, um, and. Uh, there, there is still probability if we, uh, as I understood, uh, if we can show the um, importance, so w we can win the debate, yep. Yeah, you could sort of attack them without explicitly attacking them by, for example, saying, uh, our opening really nicely explained why there's uh, more likely more feminists in society. Uh, we want to go beyond that because there's a lot of feminists in society, including me. I've never done anything feminist. I have, but you'd say that. I hope I have. You'd say, I've never done anything feminist, just as most people haven't ever done anything feminist. They just ch chat shit about feminism, if they're a feminist. So the way more intense effect is blah, 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 our argument. Does that make sense? Mm, yeah, thank you. Uh, is this the only way how we can compare with the opening of? No, no, you can say they didn't explain their argument. We're going to explain it. You can say nothing at all because you think they've lost to you already. You can very often, it, it's, uh, I think in very, very high level debates, every argument has already sort of been explained. So in closing, you'd be forced to pick one and then do a better job. Uh, it, and that would mean that you have to explain why you're doing a better job makes your contribution, why your contribution to that argument makes you win the debate. Uh, I'm saying, I think this workshop is also more about a, a singular path when you ignore rebuttal, just assuming you've explained your argument to a reasonable extent, you've re refuted other arguments uh, fairly well, this is a strategy that you can add, explaining why your argument is most important or more important than a certain team uh, to push you over the edge, to give your judge another reason to give you the win. Does that sort of answer your question? Uh, yeah, thank you. Cool. Any, anyone else? Any other questions? All right. So in that case, thank you. I had fun. I hope you did as well. Uh, if you have any questions at a later point in time, feel free to message me either on Facebook or on uh, Discord or um, via conveners and stuff, by organizing, um, and I'll happily answer them. My name is Gigi Gil. I know it sounds like a fake, but it's my real name. And have a lot of fun uh, the rest of this weekend, and uh, hopefully I'll see you soon in a different debating thing. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank You're you. welcome. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.